All right, here we are, Leviticus uh, for Beginners Training for Holiness, the last, uh, last uh, class in this uh, series. I've enjoyed teaching it. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the uh, experience and the exercise of learning more about this, uh, this book of the Old Testament. Uh, lesson 13, uh, the title of this lesson, Practicing Holiness. We're going to go from Leviticus 21 to 27, a bit of a long lesson, so you'll have to stay with me here. All right, well, let's begin by once more, one last time, showing the uh, outline that we have, uh, that we have followed uh, through, um, uh, throughout the course. We've uh, concentrated our study actually on the sacrificial system itself since uh, most of the references in the future books of the Bible will mention the tabernacle complex and its furnishings and uh, uh, the, uh, the priests and what they did. So uh, I purposefully took more time explaining that because that'll be a point of reference uh, in the future. Uh, being familiar with the type of offerings and their purpose will be useful along uh, with the rules about blood and regulations about clean and unclean, which we read about all the way into the uh, New Testament. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we finished the section about the laws for holy living in everyday life for the common Jew in our last uh, class. And so this final lesson will briefly review the priestly regulations for holy living, the responsibilities of the nation as a whole to witness its holiness and then finally, the purpose behind these laws, the reward and punishment attached to them from God, followed by the vows to keep them by the people. So there's a short, uh, a short summary of what we're gonna try to do in this, uh, in this last lesson. Um, we're gonna talk about priestly responsibilities, first of all, in uh, chapters 21 and 22. These two chapters are often referred to as the, the handbook for priests, the handbook for priests in that they dealt with the daily work life experience of the priests. In the nation of Israel, all were holy as God's people, but because they served the people before God, the priests were more holy and held to a much higher standard. And the high priest, of course, who ministered in the Holy of Holies was considered the most holy and was judged against the highest of, uh, of standards. These chapters therefore provided the following guidelines for priests. They begin with rules that apply to, uh, to all priests. So we begin first of all with rules about mourning for the dead in chapter uh, 21. Basically as priests, they were not permitted to, uh, to mourn uh, or do the things that mourners did to express their grief. Uh, in those days, things like uh, touching the body, for example, or shaving their heads or trimming their beards, these were pagan practices. Uh, they weren't to cut their flesh or you know, tear their clothing. That, that was a Jewish practice. Uh, or put ashes on their head or even attend the funeral. The exception was uh, for nearest family. Uh, parents, children, brother, virgin, unmarried sister, or wife. Uh, not mentioned, but assumed here. To mourn beyond these people, in other words, to mourn a cousin or brother-in-law, so on and so forth, to mourn beyond these would be to profane himself. The idea was that as priest, constant requirement to mourn extended family, leaders of the people, friends who uh, render uh, him unclean uh, too often. In other words, uh, attending funerals uh, would uh, necessitate the priest to, to touch and to, to mix with people and would make him uh, ritually unclean. And so uh, he, was to, uh, he was to avoid uh, these um, situations as much as uh, uh, possible in order to attend to his more important duties uh, on a daily basis at the tabernacle. As far as marriage is concerned, chapter 21, verses seven to nine, um, priests were not to marry uh, a woman who had been divorced, uh, certainly not a harlot, because this would make him ceremonially unclean and thus he'd be unable to serve. Uh, 
Um, he had to maintain the behavior of his children for the very same reason. Uh, people were to help the priest maintain holiness by considering and treating him as such. He was a priest, uh, you had to help him do uh, his work and certainly not present any situation where he might become uh, again ritually unclean. There were rules for the high priest in chapter 21. The rules for mourning and marriage were combined uh, for the high priest. First, he was not to mourn for anyone, including his wife. He couldn't leave the tabernacle and interrupt his work if someone died while he was there. He could not express grief while at the tabernacle complex. Also, he could only marry a virgin Israelite woman. Uh, and this was necessary since the high priesthood was a hereditary, uh, hereditary position and uh, had to be the firstborn child uh, and not a child that was uh, adopted. Also, uh, in uh, chapter 21, you have uh, regulations about the defects that disqualified someone from serving in the priesthood. Even if they were born in Aaron's family line, uh, if they had physical defects, they would not be allowed to serve. It was very simple. Priests were to be perfect physically, just as the animals that were offered had to be without, uh, without blemish. The list of imperfections are representative. Again, a sampling. For example, a deformed limb, any limb, a finger, a foot, a toe. Um, uh, someone who was blind, for example, couldn't serve. Someone who was deaf or had a speech impediment. Uh, any skin disease, deformation, any scarring, anything not normal disqualified uh, a person unless it was temporary, like a cold or he, he had a sprained ankle or something like that. Being disqualified from the priesthood, however, did not exclude you from the priestly family. You, you weren't excommunicated because you were not able to serve as a, as a priest. The one disqualified still ate the priest's portion of sacrifices offered and also benefited from the tithes that were paid to support the priest and his family. In other words, you remained in the family and you kept your family you know, the advantages of being in the priestly family, but you couldn't serve as a priest. Um, there were other things that uh, someone who wasn't qualified could do, however, um, in the tabernacle complex, but uh, one who was, uh, had some imperfection could not enter the holy place or the holy of holies. The idea was that only those without physical impairments living under the highest moral standards could approach God with unblemished sacrifices and only for a moment with all things done according to strict rules under the penalty of death. It was a very, very demanding uh, role, the high priest and the priests as well. This was done to emphasize the holiness of God and the degree of holiness required by men in order to come before him only for a brief moment. All of this, of course, would eventually demonstrate the value of Christ's gift that would allow every man and every woman uh, to interact with God in ways that the priests uh, could not even imagine in their day. Next would be um, the requirements to eat the priestly portions. That's in Leviticus chapter two, verses one to 16. The priests who uh, offered the sacrifices receive a share of the animal as a form of, of support for their work. For example, the peace offerings, we talked about that in previous lessons. However, there were two regulations that permitted them to do so. First, they had to be ritually clean to do so. People in the priestly family who were ritually unclean, uh, perhaps they had touched a dead thing or something like that, um, had to first become ritually clean before they could eat the meat of the sacrifices. And secondly, they had to belong to the priestly family. These included wives, sons, daughters, living at home, or a slave bought by the family. All others were not permitted to eat of the sacrifice. Then there were requirements for the sacrificial animals themselves. 
This section is addressed to the people in general, including foreigners living among them. Verse 21 specifies that the Lord is referring to peace offerings of which there were three kinds, thanksgiving, a votive offering, remember, uh, as a result of a vow, and free will offerings, and which were, uh, these were shared with the, uh, uh, with the priests. These type of offerings were shared with the uh, priests. Just as the priests who offered the sacrifices had to be without defect physically, so did the animals they sacrificed. Otherwise, they would not be acceptable to, uh, to God. The only exception was for a free will offering. You know, a free will offering was to give thanks uh, and to share with, uh, with others who were there. This offering um, uh, could be done with an animal that had minimal uh, defects, uh, but uh, even an animal with minimal defects could be offered if it was a, a peace offering and a free will peace offering. That was the exception. There were other uh, requirements, additional requirements for sacrifices in chapter 22. First, you couldn't sacrifice a mother and its young together. Uh, this was a practice that was, um, that was done among pagan religions, but you weren't allowed to do that uh, in the Jewish sacrificial uh, system. Uh, and also it would deplete the herd and or the flock too quickly if it was done. Secondly, uh, the sacrifices were to be eaten by the people on the day that they were sacrificed. Doing so completed the offering and confirmed God's acceptance. So eating, eating of the sacrifice wasn't just uh, like an advantage. Oh, we, we, you know, we offer a sacrifice, but we get to eat some of it and that's a good thing. No, eating the sacrifice was part of the offering of the sacrifice. When you finally had done all the requirements in offering the animal, and then the part that came to the priest or to the individual uh, were left, eating it was the final step of the sacrificial process. It confirmed that the sacrifice had been accepted uh, by God. In verses 31 to 33, God reinforces the necessity to obey his commands. And again, this is repeated. Why is it important to obey his commands? Number one, the Lord is God. You know, the commands are coming from God, so it's important to obey God. Two, he is holy and thus they needed to be holy. And their holiness was cultivated, developed through their obedience to God. And three, he both saved and made a covenant with the people uh, that uh, he would help them keep. And so obey my commands, and in doing so, I'm going to help you maintain the covenant uh, that we made, uh, that I made with you as a people. All right, well, in chapter 23 to 25, we move on to another topic, and these are national responsibilities. After a brief uh, introduction, God gives Moses seven appointed times or feasts to observe in various ways where both the priests and the people will make a united and public witness of their faith in order to both remember and to teach what their holy God has done for them and has done with them. There were seven of these, uh, they were called convocations, convocations, and the word convocation uh, means assemblies. So there were seven of these convocations or feasts or appointed times and each one included three elements. First, there was a gathering of God's people for worship. Second, there was an offering of sacrifice at the sanctuary. And third, there was a day of rest where the people did no work. So here are the seven appointed days uh, that were given. The first one was of course the Sabbath day. Uh, it was observed uh, on the seventh day, Saturday, it was a day of complete rest. Um, it was a time for assembly and worship and a day that was devoted to the Lord and it was observed by everyone. Now up on the slide, you see a, a calendar of sorts and uh, let's just look at the, uh, the top row there. First, it says the number of months. So the sacred sequence, that's the religious calendar and the civil sequence that's the agricultural calendar, all right? Uh, 
And so uh, at first they had only the agricultural calendar, but when the people were freed from Egyptian bondage, God gave them a new calendar uh, that they were to follow, which was their religious calendar. Then you had the Hebrew name for each of the month, uh, each of the months rather, uh, the modern equivalent. In other words, the, the, the modern equivalent isn't just a specific days, but uh, you know, uh, the days bleed uh, from one month to another month. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the first uh, month in the sacred uh, calendar, the month of Abib or Nisan, uh, today in, in, in our calendar, Western calendar, that month takes place on days uh, in March and April, okay? And then the next uh, column would be the feasts uh, that are supposed to take place uh, on those days uh, for the religious calendar. And then it says agriculture. And those are the uh, agricultural events that, uh, that take place. Uh, during the different uh, months. So there's the, there's the calendar that we, um, that we look at, that we uh, use. Uh, so the first uh, uh, day of uh, you know, convocation was the Sabbath day that took place uh, you know, every seventh day, which was uh, Saturday. The second one given was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread in uh, chapter 23, verses four to eight. Now the Passover is the first feast given to the Jews, Exodus chapter 12, verse three to 13, and is the first public feast to appear on the uh, religious calendar. And you can follow that there, it's a little, it's darkened, so you can see which feast we're, uh, we're talking about. It was on the 14th of Nisan, uh, uh, on that particular month. Um, Passover is a remembrance of the final plague where God's angel took the life of every firstborn in Egypt, both human and animal, but passed over every Jewish home that had sacrificed a lamb and had painted its blood, you know, the blood of the lamb on the door frame um, of, their, um, of their homes. Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread began on the day after the Passover, in other words, on the 15th of Nisan, and it continued for seven days. So the Jews had to uh, follow these instructions to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. First, uh, they were not to eat any leavened bread for seven days. On the first and on the seventh day, the people were not to do any uh, labor, any work. On the first and seventh day, the people were to assemble for worship, and on each of the seven days, they were to offer a sacrifice burnt on the uh, altar. The uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread was uh, one of uh, three feasts where the men were to make a pilgrimage to the main sanctuary in Jerusalem. So not every feast uh, required them to go to Jerusalem, but three feasts required that, and uh, one of those was the Passover and the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. The next feast is a uh, Feast of the First Fruits. Uh, this was given as something the Jews would do once they were settled in the Promised Land. Uh, in the wilderness, of course, they had no crops uh, while wandering in the desert. Uh, it was not a separate festival, but it was connected to the Passover and the unleavened uh, bread week. Um, Passover and unleavened bread occurred in the spring, which coincided with the early um, harvest period, which would be the barley crop. The Lord's instructions concerning the first fruits were as follows. First, each uh, brought a sheaf of barley to the priest sometime before the Sabbath, the Sabbath day after the Passover. This was representing the entire uh, crop. This sheaf, along with the lamb, grain, and wine was offered as a sacrifice to the Lord on the day of the Sabbath, uh, excuse me, on the day after the Sabbath. And then the people could not eat of the harvest until this sacrifice of first fruits was made to God. The idea was uh, they would offer the first fruits, if you wish, to God as a sacrifice of thanksgiving and blessing and so on and so forth. 
And only after that was done would they themselves begin to eat of that harvest. The next feast is the Feast of Weeks in chapter 23. From that Sabbath day after Passover, seven weeks were counted off and then the Feast of Weeks was celebrated the next, uh, the next day. This feast has been referred to in different ways and that's why there's some confusion sometimes. They're always talking about the same feast but they give it different names. So here's a list of the names by which it was uh, known. It was known as the Feast of Weeks, you know, seven weeks after Passover, 49 days, and then on the 50th day. It was known as the Feast of Harvest, Exodus 23, 16, because it came at the beginning of the wheat harvest. It was known as the Day of First Fruits uh, in Numbers 28, 26, uh, because it was during the harvest period. And then uh, probably the one we know the most as Christians, it was the day of Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost, uh, penta, Greek word for 50, 50 days after the Passover, the Feast of Pentecost. It was observed in the following way at the temple. Uh, a grain offering was made, the first fruits. Several animals, grain and wine were sacrificed. There was no work on that day. Also a feast requiring a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. That's why in Acts 2 we read about the thousands and the many people who were in Jerusalem on that day for that feast of Pentecost. It was required that the men go uh, to Jerusalem to the sanctuary on that particular feast. And uh, they were to remember the poor. Uh, in verse 22 it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, moreover you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleaning of your harvest. You are to leave them for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. So we mentioned this uh, before in the previous uh, lesson uh, that uh, they were to care for the poor. Uh, and uh, one way of doing that was uh, having only one pass on their fields or in their fields when they were harvesting and they were to leave the corners and what, what, what had fallen behind to the gleaners and to the uh, people who were poor, unlike in pagan countries where they would you know, pass through a field to harvest it and they'd go two or three times to make sure they collected everything so that there'd be nothing left. The next feast that they talk about is the Feast of Trumpets chapter 23, 23 to 25. This feast occurred on the first day of the seventh month. The people were called together by the blowing of the trumpets, Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. The day was to be observed as a day of rest. They also held an assembly and offered sacrifice. Now in later years, Israel's seventh month became its first month of its civil calendar and the Feast of Trumpets became its New Year's Day. They still keep the festival and celebrate the day under the name Rosh uh, Hashanah, uh, meaning uh, head or first uh, of, the, uh, of the year. Uh, the next feast is uh, the Day of Atonement, uh, which we have studied. Uh, we've reviewed this feast before in Leviticus chapter 16. Here uh, we see the priestly responsibilities for this day. In this chapter, instructions are given for what the people are to do to observe this occasion, because we've already seen what the priest had to do to uh, fulfill his obligations on the day of uh, atonement. And so the feast was on the 10th day of the seventh month, and uh, the people were to humble their souls and make appropriate sacrifice. This usually meant a day of fasting and no work. This is when the high priest entered the Holy of Holies for the only time in that year to sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice above and in front of the Ark of the Covenant. All year, individuals brought sacrifices to atone for their personal sins, but on the Day of Atonement, the sins of all the people, including the priests and the high priests, were atoned for. And then the seventh one was the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles in Leviticus 23. This was the last feast in the, uh, in the cycle. It began on the 15th day of the seven, 
month and it went on for seven days. Uh, there was no work during this period. There was an assembly on the first day and on the eighth and final day and different types uh, and quantities of sacrifices were offered on each day that the feast lasted. These were in addition to the regular sacrifices. Remember at the very beginning we said that uh, at the temple or at the tabernacle every day there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice that the priests would offer. And this was in addition to all the sacrifices that the people brought during the day. Now uh, an interesting uh, thing about the uh, Feast of Booths is that the Jews were also required to build outdoor shelters or booths from branches and leafy trees in which they would live for seven days, hence the name Feast of Booths. This was done as a reminder of how they lived after God freed them from Egyptian slavery. The feast was held after the grape and olive harvests and was a time of great rejoicing as they thanked God for, his, uh, for their present abundance, as well as his constant care and provision while they were in the wilderness, often living in temporary shelters before entering the, uh, the promised land. These feasts generally followed the agricultural calendar of that time, but God combined these with spiritual elements that gave opportunity to give prayer and thanks for abundant harvests, as well as recognizing their unique status as God's holy people. Other nations had various religious feasts as well, uh, many of which were tied to uh, their agricultural cycle, but no one else had a day of atonement or a Passover acknowledging God's actual personal involvement in their nation's life. Israel's worship uh, teaches us seven basic truths about worship in general. And I've listed them here for you. Um, so here are the seven basic truths about worship in general. First, worship creates a community distinct from the world. Secondly, worship uh, is about remembering and learning. Worship is about praising and thanking God. It's about giving. It's about seeking and obtaining forgiveness. Worship is about renewing our commitment to God and worship is about rejoicing. And, and, and so these seven elements here were part of the worship of the Jews, but they're also part of our worship today. Our worship today is about uh, a community being distinct from others. Aren't we called out of this world? you know, out of the world of darkness into the kingdom of light? Are we not supposed to be salt and light? Uh, do we not remember when we take the communion? We're remembering the sacrifice of Jesus and learning what it has done for us. Worship is about praising and thanking God. Do we not praise and thank God in our songs and in our prayers? It's a modern worship. It's about giving, of course. We, we, we use the opportunity of being together to give a portion uh, of that which uh, we have been prospered uh, to the Lord for the work of the church. It's about seeking and obtaining forgiveness. Uh, how many of our prayers that go up to God during worship are prayers asking God to forgive us for our sins, to forgive us for falling short, for forgive us to, because we've done what we said we wouldn't do or we didn't do what we were said, you know, we were going to do, isn't, it? isn't that part of our prayers uh, on, on the Lord's day? About our commitment to God, how many times have people come forward to say I'm recommitting my life to God? And of course about rejoicing, not only rejoicing in our praise and in our worship, but it's about rejoicing and usually we see the rejoicing in the fellowship aspect. You know, there's always great joy and happiness in being together and rejoicing about our common faith and, and being able to express our faith freely uh, uh, during the time of, uh, of worship on the Lord's day. So these lessons, these factors, these elements are, are part of both the Old Testament worship of the Jews and our worship today, even though the, the procedure is very, uh, is very different from that time 
until now. And so these uh, all factor, as I say, into both the Jewish worship of God as well as the Christian worship of God. The methods are different, but what links the two together is the common concept that both have been called upon to be the holy people of God and our worship is to reflect that idea. We've also been called to be the holy people of God in our day and age. All right, well, we move on to another category here of information, and this is special responsibilities for the priests. Um, in the Handbook for Priests, uh, chapter 24, could have had the title miscellaneous, since it deals with disparate things. Uh, and so here are the things that this chapter uh, talks about in connection with the uh, daily responsibilities of the priesthood. First of all, uh, in chapters one to four, uh, there's information about the daily care and keeping of the lampstand within the holy place, burning from evening to morning each day with a specially pressed olive oil designed for this purpose. And this, keeping the lamp burning, this was the responsibility of the high priest. This was his task. Number two, uh, chapter 24, five to nine, are instructions concerning the bread of presence on the table reserved for this purpose, situated in the holy place as well. First, uh, there were 12 cakes of bread. They were made from fine flour with no leaven. They were placed on a table of pure gold, two stacks of six uh, cakes. Uh, frankincense was put on the bread. When the bread was removed, the frankincense was burned as an offering to God. Uh, new loaves were laid out every Sabbath day, and this was to be done in perpetuity. And only the priests were to eat the old bread and they had to eat it in a holy place. Why? because the bread was holy. Why? Because of its proximity to God, who was in the Holy of Holies. And the bread was there in the holy place next to, to the Holy of Holies. Therefore, the table was holy, the bread on it was holy. So if you were to eat it, you had to eat it in a holy place. Number three, 24, 10 to 16, are the instructions concerning push, punishment for blasphemy or for not observing the Sabbath. Uh, so there's a, a case of blasphemy. Blasphemy is uh, the improper use of God's name. Uh, a case of blasphemy is brought to Moses for action. And Moses seeks God and God replies that the punishment for blasphemy or cursing God is death by stoning. The witnesses were to lay hands on the man's head to confirm their witness and the people would bring him outside the camp because to do so inside the camp would, would be to defile it and then they would carry out the punishment. Then uh, the, fourth, uh, the fourth thing, uh, 24, 17 to 22, was a punishment for other cases. Uh, the punishment for murder was death the punishment for various crimes, like killing uh, of an animal or injuring someone. Um, each case was considered separately and uh, a just compensation was calculated and paid by the guilty party. The priests served, you know, uh, I said they served as physicians, you know, for the leprosy, for determining, uh, determining leprosy, but they also served as, as judges uh, to determine punishments for various uh, uh, infractions. Uh, so this was the idea of the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The idea was not revenge. Today, a lot of times say, well, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you know, uh, you hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you back. Uh, the, the whole point of the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth uh, was to have fair compensation. So that if you uh, borrowed someone's animal and you mistreated it and it died, well then you had to replace that animal plus you know, 20% or something. The idea was to regulate fair compensation so that there would not be uh, revenge and war and uh, social strife. Um, in chapter 24, verse 23, the punishment for the blasphemer we see is carried out as a warning and as an example to, uh, to others. The next section in uh, Leviticus 25 
uh, deals with national responsibilities that are continued. The previous chapter can, contained some uh, miscellaneous information or consequences of breaking certain laws, but it quickly returns to the main theme of this section of the book, and that is the national responsibilities of a nation devoted to the pursuit of holiness. Um, uh, the pursuit of holiness is demonstrated privately in our lives as we, uh, uh, as we use the sacrificial system, as we determine between clean and unclean, but in a national way, the special or appointed times to keep given previously dealt with special days and weeks and months. And in this chapter, the appointed times deal in years. And that is the sabbatical year and the year of Jubilee. And what I'm, what I'm, the point I'm getting across is that uh, the Jews witnessed their holiness, not only privately between themselves and the priests and certainly before God, but they also did it nationally through their various feasts and festivals throughout the year. And now uh, two uh, feasts, if you wish, two observances that actually took place over a period of years. So the first is the sabbatical uh, year, chapter 25, verses one to seven. The sabbatical year meant that once they entered the promised land, they could cultivate the land for six years, but they had to leave it fallow on the seventh year. That's why they call it the sabbatical year. They could eat and use whatever grew naturally, but were not allowed to cultivate or work the land in any way during the sabbatical year. This demonstrated not only their submission and uh, respect for the idea that it was God's land, but also that God would provide for them even if they lost the produce um, of that resource every seven years. Every seven years, they weren't allowed to work the land. That means there was no harvest. How was God going to you know, take care of them? Because uh, th this was an agricultural uh, community. The idea was that God would take care of them in some way and respecting the sabbatical year uh, demonstrated that to the nation and to the people uh, around them. Uh, the other uh, festival or uh, the other observance was the year of Jubilee in chapter 25, eight to uh, 55. Now the year of Jubilee occurred every 50 years in other words, after seven cycles of sabbatical years, you know, every seven years you had to leave the land fallow. Well, after seven cycles of sabbatical year, you had the year of Jubilee. The year was announced by blowing a ram's horn from which the term Jubilee comes from. Now, the Jubilee had two objectives. First, um, uh, you return the land that was sold or lost or transferred somehow back to the individual from one of the 12 tribes who originally owned it back at the time when the land was distributed by, uh, well, by Moses and Joshua actually to the 12 tribes. When they entered in uh, to the uh, promised land, Joshua divided up the land among the 12 tribes. So if you were if you owned a piece of land, you know, uh, your tribal, uh, your tribal ancestry uh, owned this land and you had a track of land and for some reason or other you had to sell it. You had bad crops, you had debts, whatever. You had to sell that land. Well, that land would revert back to you after 50 years. On the year of Jubilee, the land, whatever land, uh, had been sold or transferred to someone else would return back to the original owner uh, of that land so that the, um, the uh, integrity of the division of land would remain stable. Because every 50 years, all the land would go back and all the territories would remain uh, in the same way that they were uh, designed when Joshua allotted the various uh, portions of land to the, uh, to, the, uh, 12, uh, to the 12 tribes. Uh, Israelites, not foreigners, uh, who had become uh, slaves, for example, by indebtedness, uh, which was the most common way of uh, being enslaved, uh, whether uh, through indebtedness or war or other means, uh, 
uh, on the year of Jubilee, they were given their release and freedom along with a stake to help them start over and succeed as free men. So those were the two things that took place uh, on the year of Jubilee, returning the land to the original owners and those, who, those Israelis who had been in, enslaved for whatever reason were uh, set free. These changes had enormous economic and social impact on the people. And so chapter five provides the details and the instructions necessary to guide the people involved in land transfers or the release of, uh, of uh, slaves. Uh, so if you were buying land, uh, you know, you would calculate, well, you know, how far are we uh, from the um, year of Jubilee? If the year of Jubilee was still 35 years away, uh, you had the potential of cultivating, uh, you know, that land uh, for 35 years and making a profit and so on and so forth. So it was worth a lot more. Uh, if on the other hand, uh, you were only two years away from Jubilee, then you only had access to that land for two years in order to exploit its uh, resources. And so therefore the price of that land was a lot less, okay? Same thing for a slave. Uh, the value of a slave uh, went up and down depending on how far you were from the day of a Jubilee. Um, the year was announced uh, by the blowing of a ram's horn on the day of atonement, the 10th day of the seventh month, in the last day of the seventh cycle of the sabbatical year. So, you know, seven cycles of sabbatical years would go by. You're on year 49. In year 49, the trumpets would blow to announce that the year of Jubilee uh, was coming. The prime objective, as I said, for the year of Jubilee was to provide a release to all Israel, release of the land to its original owners, release uh, of a, a slave back to his home and back to his family. So chapter 25 provides the details on how this was done in a practical and proper way uh, to smooth out an orderly transfer of both land and people during the year of Jubilee. Next section, we have uh, the reasons for practicing holiness, and that is the blessings and the curses that are attached to obeying or not obeying uh, the, uh, the laws on uh, holiness. So as we near the end of the book, the author turns from his main teaching that God is holy and his people must learn to be holy if they want to have a relationship with him. That's the main theme, that's the main teaching. Most of the book follows this theme and it provides instructions on what and how uh, on the what and how of holiness. This chapter focuses on the why of holiness and the why is quite clear. Why pursue holiness? That's the question. Why obey God? Why follow the rules? Well, the answer is very simple. There were blessings if you did and there were curses if you didn't. And so the chapter breaks them down in the following way. It begins with the blessings. If you obey, here are the blessings. And the blessings are not uh, you know, high minded. The blessings are quite uh, down to earth, if you wish. If you obey and pursue holiness, you'll have abundant crops. You'll have everything needed for this, rain, good weather, regular harvests. You'll have a peaceful existence. Uh, you know, God will eliminate harmful beasts. There won't be any threats of war. And if you are attacked, you'll be victorious. Uh, uh, another blessing, and that would be a growing population and abundant food to feed a growing population. And so the women would be fertile. Uh, there would be food to sustain a growing population. A growing population meant uh, wealth, strength. Uh, you know, it gave the people uh, a confidence. Uh, and of course, uh, there were many reasons to give thanks. Uh, you know, uh, a baby is always a reason uh, for happiness and for, and for joy. And so a growing population is a population that often experiences joy and happiness. And then of course, the most important, they would remain in God's presence and God would remain with them. God would 
be with them, to continue to bless them and to protect them. This, I believe, was the most important blessing that, uh, that came with obeying the rules, with pursuing holiness. Well, after listing these, of course, uh, Moses lists the curses. There are blessings if you obey, but there are curses and the curses are progressive. In other words, if you do, then, you know, if you do this, then I'll do that. Also, the curses uh, were not only meant to punish, but also to lead the people to repentance and the restoration uh, as a result of that punishment. So here are the things listed, um, the curses, disease, crop failure and defeat against enemies, drought and its consequences, a plague of wild beasts, uh, war, pestilence and hunger, destruction, deportation, desolation, and then captivity and desolation in faraway places. Taken together, these curses bring the Israelite back full circle into being a people with no leader, no land, no wealth, and no freedom, just as they were in Egypt before God freed them from slavery. So in essence, you know, if you disobey, the curses will ultimately bring you back to square one where you were when God called you to be his uh, holy people. Then of course, you can't have sin without the opportunity uh, for repentance. In um, chapter 26, uh, 40 to 43, so as far as repentance is concerned, God, the holy God, still holds out the possibility of saving them if they repent, which included uh, confessing their sins and the sins of their fathers, humbling themselves before God and acknowledging that He is God and they are in submission to Him. Even if they have failed, their normal position should be uh, in submission to Him and His laws. And thirdly, to accept their punishment or their situation and trust that God will liberate them and deliver them and reestablish them. The next section deals with God's promise in chapter uh, 26 verses 44 and 45. I want to read this. It says, yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them for I am the Lord their God, but I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am uh, the Lord. So despite all that has happened, God promises not to reject or abandon his people. You know, he says, I'll bless you this way and I'll curse you this way if, if, you, if you disobey. However, I won't abandon you. I won't abandon you. Uh, despite everything that happens, despite the curses that I've laid down before you, I won't abandon you. Why? Well, first of all, the covenant. He had made a covenant with them and he was going to be true to the promise that he made, even if they were not. That was a, this is the nature of our God. He is true, even if we are not. And secondly, he's the Lord. And this is how the holy God acts. He keeps his word. He keeps his promise, the promise of the covenant. And so in chapter 26, uh, Moses provides a summary. He closes the book with a summary of facts contained in Leviticus. He, the Lord, gave the statutes and laws to Moses, the human author who gave them to the people at Mount, at Mount Sinai. And the next section is the evidence of holiness in chapter 27, as we uh, head into the close of the book. This final chapter uh, deals with vows that are made to God. The large part of Leviticus teaches what God requires of man. This section describes things that God did, uh, excuse me, things that God did not command, but that man wanted to offer to God anyways. A vow was a promise made by someone to give something to God if God would enable him to accomplish his objective. All that time, or at that time rather, God had made no laws requiring vows. However, if a person made a vow, he was uh, 
bound to keep the vow. In most situations, the things or people vowed to the Lord were replaced by a money gift in most cases, right? Someone says, I vow I'm going to give a bull or something like that. Well, then uh, he could give the, you know, the value of the bull, he could give that to the, uh, to the priest uh, and, 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 keep the, uh, and keep the animal. That this was, this was uh, permissible. Well, this chapter here uh, provides guidelines in determining the value in monetary terms of what was being offered because you know, they offered different things. What was to be the value? How much money was necessary to redeem you know, an animal or a crop or a house or a, even a person? And so uh, here we have uh, various valuations for people, for animals, so on and so forth. So let's just go through these here. Uh, first, uh, the valuation of persons that were dedicated to God, uh, chapter 27, one to eight. Now the coinage used was the shekel of the sanctuary. Uh, the shekel of the sanctuary was used to guarantee a consistent weight of silver, which was kept by the priest. Money vowed given to priests for ministry. The priests uh, considered the holy men of the, of the nation would make sure that the, the, the weight, you know, the silver weight would remain the same. And so it would guarantee fairness and consistency in this exchange of, uh, of money. So if a male uh, between the ages of 20 and 60 uh, was offered, you know, was vowed and offered to the Lord, the exchange for that would be 50 shekels. If it was a female, it'd be 30 shekels. And it goes on to say a male 5 to 20 years of age, 20 shekels. If it's a female, 10 shekels. One month to five years old, five shekels. Female, three shekels. 60 plus years, 15 shekels. If it's a female, 10 shekels. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, oh boy, what a, you know, uh, what a system, you know, uh, what, a, what a system. A chauvinistic uh, system. Men, uh, you know, worth more than women. Well, men were worth more in the agriculture system because the agricultural, the agriculture system at the time uh, had a premium on physical strength. You needed to be strong in order to plow, in order to you know, harvest and so on and so forth. And so there were discounts uh, uh, you know, for, for men. Men were worth more because they were stronger, period. It was just a fact of life. They also had discounts for those who were very poor. Then uh, they go on to give uh, information about animals, the valuation of animals. Now you couldn't exchange clean animals for money. Unclean animals could be exchanged for uh, their value plus 20%. Uh, for example, a donkey or a blemished, uh, a clean animal uh, could be exchanged instead. You keep the animal, uh, you give money instead. Then there was the valuation of property in uh, 27, 14 to 25. Vowing a house, vowing to give a property or a field was evaluated in two ways. One, uh, the condition of the house or the production of the land. And two, the proximity to the year of Jubilee. Remember I explained to you, so you're making a vow the year of Jubilee is next year, uh, you know, you're, 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 the value of what you're giving is much less. If the year of Jubilee is 25 years away, then the value of what you're giving is much higher. Therefore, you know, the monetary value also uh, increases. And then there is the unvowed gifts, uh, things or people, that God did not permit. There were some vows he would not permit you to make. For example, uh, you couldn't uh, vow a firstborn person or animal in your family. And why is that? Because that firstborn was already uh, vowed to the Lord, already belonged to the Lord. Uh, chapter 27, uh, we read in 26 to 33. Or you couldn't vow people or property that were won in battle against pagans. You know, we, we, we had a battle against uh, some pagan nation 
uh, we, got, we got gold and uh, various objects and we're going to give these to the Lord. Well, you couldn't because those objects, because they were pagan, uh, were unclean, uh, ceremonially unclean. So you, they couldn't be offered. And then the tithe, you couldn't vow your tithe because your tithe already uh, uh, was owned by God, was already owed to God. So you couldn't, you know, you couldn't give it twice. All right, so those were some of the things that you, you couldn't do. And then in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 34, we read the following. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. The final statement repeats that all of the laws previously recorded in this book are from God, given to Moses at Sinai. This means four things, one, Moses wrote Leviticus at Sinai, not long after they left Egypt, as some commentators uh, say. Secondly, uh, everything in Leviticus are God's commandments to the Jews as part of their covenant with God. And their covenant was, he was to be their God, they were to be his people. He was a holy God, therefore they were to be a holy people. And the commands given in Leviticus were to teach them how to become holy and how to maintain their holiness. Thirdly, they were to be obeyed by the Jews under pain of punishment or death. In other words, there were consequences. These laws were not just uh, for fun. They weren't suggestions. Uh, to disobey the laws brought consequences. And then finally, we who are under the new covenant with Christ are not subject to these laws. You have lots of religions that pop up and you have lots of uh, uh, Christian groups uh, that uh, tend to borrow things from the Old Testament and bring them into the New Testament and try to impose them on people. But uh, we are not under this covenant, therefore we're not under this law. We read in Galatians 3, Paul says the following, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus no longer under a tutor. He could have said, you're no longer under the law. We're now under the law of grace. We're now under the law of Christ. Well, uh, this uh, completes our class on Leviticus. I thank you for uh, participating. Uh, and I'm saying thank you uh, for you to, to participate in the class and those who have participated by watching the videos. Uh, if you're watching this one, it means you've managed to get through all uh, 13 of the uh, videos. And I want to mention once again, if, you, if you've enjoyed this and you want more, some, some people say, boy, I'd like to know more about this or that particular aspect that was discussed in class. I highly recommend this commentary, Truth For Today commentary uh, on Leviticus uh, by uh, Brother uh, Coy D. Roper. Uh, member of the Church of Christ. Uh, this uh, commentary set for all the books in the Bible written by scholars associated with the uh, Churches of Christ. I can highly recommend it and I do thank the people that put this together. It's a wonderful resource able to get a lot of information about these, you know, about these uh, obscure rules and laws and so on and so forth. Makes a, uh, makes a, a great addition to our knowledge of uh, of God's people, God's laws, and also helps us to understand uh, the New Testament uh, and the gospel um, in, a, in a different way, in a deeper way, uh, I believe. So I encourage you to check out uh, other uh, Bible book series on BibleTalk.tv if you've not gone to our website, BibleTalk.tv. And uh, on the website, uh, there are over 1,500 videos that you can access all for free. Uh, we have over 75 different series on different books of the Bible. As a matter of fact, we have a series on every single book of the New Testament, plus series on various books of the uh, Old Testament, uh, all free to view, to download. There's plenty of resources if you're a Bible school teacher, 
uh, lots of great resources, student workbooks, teacher workbooks, again, all can be downloaded uh, without cost. It's our way, uh, it's our way of serving the Lord, it's our way of serving the church, it's our way of uh, getting the message of Christ uh, out uh, into the world. So I thank you uh, very much and I pray that uh, God blesses you in your study and in your knowledge of his word and the knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.